Good day, everyone, and welcome to the Cathedral of the Holy Cross. My name is Bishop Reed, the president of the Catholic TV Network. In these days of Holy Week, it is our great privilege to allow you to participate in the solemn liturgies which mark the great mysteries of our faith. The Chrism Mass is appointed to be offered on Holy Thursday, but for the convenience of the priests and those who collaborate with them so that they might be present here and carry the holy oils back to their parish communities, this Mass is typically celebrated earlier in the week. And so here we are today at the Cathedral. The Chrism Mass really is a great gathering of the whole Archdiocesan family, with people coming from so many parishes. And during this Mass, the Bishop of the Diocese, in our case, the Archbishop, blesses the oil of catechumens, the oil of the sick, and consecrates the oil of chrism. These oils, blessed and consecrated by Cardinal Sean, are to form an important part of the sacramental life of our communities during the year. This Mass also acknowledges the ministry of priests, invites them to renew their commitment of service and receive the prayers and support of the people. Welcome to our presentation today of the Chrism Mass from the Cathedral of the Holy Cross in Boston, South End.
In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Peace be with you. My dear friends, it's with great joy that I welcome all of you to the Cathedral of the Holy Cross for this Chrism Mass, those who are here in the cathedral and those who are watching on Catholic television. It's a special joy for us and a privilege to have visiting this morning His Eminence Methodius, who is the Metropolitan of the Greek Orthodox Church, who is a dear friend and colleague for so many years, and we have been praying for you. We know that you've had some health challenges, but we're so delighted to see you here today and to know that you are restored to health and carrying on the wonderful ministry and the witness of your life in our community. Next year will be the 1700th anniversary of the Council of Nicaea, a council celebrated when we were all one church at that point. And I know that Pope Francis and the ecumenical patriarch Bartholomew are looking for ways to make this a very meaningful celebration and perhaps even being able to come up with a joint celebration of Easter, which would be very beautiful, although it would deprive me of having two Easter's every year. (laughs) But uh, Your Eminence, we are so very grateful for your presence here, and we would invite you to say a word of greeting to our priests and our people. Please be seated. Your Eminence, I thank you for the blessing that God has bestowed upon me to again be in your presence and the presence of your brother bishops and priests. Today I renew my vows. I remember why I became a priest and what my role in the world should be. You mentioned that You celebrate, as I do, two Easter's every year. And because we both believe that Easter is not something, not a date that is celebrated once or twice, but should be a celebration every day of our lives. And that we capture the risen Lord and offer him an abode in our hearts so that we may reflect his love and joy in the world in which we live. May God grant you, my brother, many years to stay with us. We need you to stay in this archdiocese to continue your visionary faith and your visionary leadership of not only the Catholic community, but the entire Christian community here in Boston and throughout New England. Thank you again for your invitation and I pray that God bless you with a happy Easter and your brother priests and bishops and the devout laity that are here today. God bless you, my brother. And now, my brothers and sisters, let us place ourselves humbly in God's presence, asking forgiveness for everything in our lives that separates us from the Lord and from one another. I confess to Almighty God and to you, my brothers and sisters, that I have greatly sinned in my thoughts and in my words, in what I have done and in what I have failed to do, through my fault, through my fault, through my most grievous fault. Therefore, I ask, Blessed Mary, ever-Virgin, all the angels and saints, and you, my brothers and sisters, to pray for me to the Lord our God. May Almighty God have mercy on us 
Forgive us our sins and bring us to life everlasting.
Let us pray. O God, who anointed your only begotten Son with the Holy Spirit and made him Christ and Lord, graciously grant that being made sharers in his consecration, we may bear witness to your redemption in the world. Through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, God forever and ever. from the book of the prophet Isaiah. The spirit of the Lord is upon me because the Lord has anointed me. He has sent me to bring glad tidings to the lowly, to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and release to the prisoners, to announce a year of favor from the Lord and a day of vindication by our God, to comfort all who mourn, to place on those who mourn in Zion a diadem of ashes, to give them oil of gladness in place of mourning, a glorious mantle instead of a listless spirit. You yourselves shall be named priests of the Lord. Ministers of our God shall you be called. I will give them their recompense faithfully. A lasting covenant I will make with them. Their descendants shall be renowned among the nations and their offsprings among the peoples. All who see them shall acknowledge them as a race the Lord has blessed. The word of the Lord. Leitura do livro do Apocalipse de São João. A voz, graça e paz, da parte de Jesus Cristo, a testemunha fiel, o primeiro a ressuscitar dentre os mortos, o soberano do reis da terra, a Jesus que nos ama, 
que por seu sangue nos libertou dos nossos pecados e que fez de nós um reino, sacerdotes para seu Deus e Pai. A ele a glória e o poder, em eternidade. Amém. Olhai, ele vem com as nuvens e todos os olhos o verão. Também aqueles que os trapassaram, todas as tribos da terra, baterão no peito por causa dele. Sim, amém. Eu sou o alfa e o ômega, diz o Senhor Deus, aquele que é, que era e que vem, o Todo-Poderoso. Palavra do Senhor. from the Holy Gospel according to Luke. Jesus came to Nazareth where he had grown up and went according to his custom into the synagogue on the Sabbath day. He stood up to read and was handed a scroll of the prophet Isaiah. He unrolled the scroll and found the passage where it was written. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to bring glad tidings to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to let the oppressed go free and to proclaim a year acceptable to the Lord. Rolling up the scroll, he handed it back to the attendant and sat down, and the eyes of all in the synagogue looked intently at him. He said to them, This is today the scripture passage which is to be fulfilled in your hearing. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. Evangelica dicta, dele antro nostro delicta.
Your Eminence, Metropolitan Methodius, my dear brother bishops, priests, deacons, fellow religious, brothers and sisters in the Lord. I'm not good at remembering dates, but Wednesday, May the 30th, 1984, is a date that I will never forget. I was summoned to the nunciature on Massachusetts Avenue, Northwest Washington. And at that point in our history, at the Centro Catolico, we were blessed to have two vehicles. One was a fleshed color Toyota with the front grill bashed in. We call the car El Scarface. <laughs> we also had a decommissioned C&P telephone repair truck with a ladder on the roof, wooden benches inside, and brown paint smeared over the logo. They told me I should take the truck because it was more dignified than Scarface. <laughs> the nunciature was not a place that I had frequented, but everybody knew where it was, right across the street from the Naval Observatory, which is the residence of the Vice President of the United States. As I was driving to the nunciature, we were experiencing a solar eclipse. The first solar eclipse visible in the United States in 33 years. When I got to the nunciature, I was told Pope John Paul II was naming me the Bishop of the Virgin Islands. I was asked if I would say yes. I commented on the eclipse. I said, it must be a sign, but I don't know what it means. The nuncio retorted, it means you're going to be the Bishop of the Virgin Islands. <laughs> I said yes, not exactly knowing what I was saying yes to. Being a priest, member of a religious order, not a canon lawyer, never worked in the chancery, never studied in Rome. I didn't even own a black suit or a pair of shoes. And to be asked to be a bishop was like being struck by lightning in a cloudless sunny sky. I didn't know I was saying yes to 40 years of wandering in the desert of Episcopal ministry in four dioceses, through hurricanes, sex abuse crisis, economic freefall, reconfiguration, Me Too crisis in the Catholic hospitals, and a series of pastoral, administrative, and financial challenges that I could never have imagined. I always joked that if I had known I was going to be a bishop, I would have studied much harder in the seminary. But quite frankly, I don't know whether it would have helped. And now, 40 years after that eclipse of the sun, I stand before you celebrating yet another Chrism Mass. What a joy. I celebrated my first Chrism Mass on Holy Thursday in the Cathedral of St. Peter and Paul in Charlotte Amalia, Virgin Islands. As in the old liturgy, we celebrated Holy Thursday morning and there were only a handful of priests and people present for the Mass. The next year, I took advantage of the indult to change the Mass to another day of the week. We celebrated it on Tuesday of Holy Week on the island of St. Croix at St. Anne's in Barren Spot. We celebrated the Mass in what was a huge circus tent with a couple of thousand people in attendance. It was the first time that any of them had been to a chrism mass. I immediately fell in love with this liturgy for so many reasons. First of all, it calls us priests to be together and to renew our priestly commitment together. I like to say it's the spiritual tune-up and oil change. The life of a priest is always about ongoing conversion. And the Chrism Mass offers us a moment that ritualizes this crucial aspect of our vocation. It's the moment to kick the tires and see how we're doing. 
The Chrism Mass also underscores our sacramental ministry. We're blessing the oils that we are going to use for baptism, confirmation, anointing of the sick, ordination of bishops and priests. And the fact that we all use the same oils blessed at the same Mass is a striking sign of the unity of our ministry. A priest is never really a lone ranger. Even if some of us are always whistling the William Tell Overture. Sadly, most Catholics go through life without ever attending a Chrism Mass or even knowing that this institution exists. So we're very grateful to Bishop Reed and Catholic Television for allowing so many people to experience this beautiful liturgy and rescue it from being the Disciplina Arcani of being a clerical secret handshake. I'm always glad when we have young people from our Catholic schools and parishes at the Chrism Mass. Many of you will be receiving confirmation in months to come, and today you experience the blessing of the Chrism that will be used for your confirmation, another sign of our unity as members of the Church. At this Chrism Mass, on behalf of all of the Catholics of the Archdiocese, I want to thank you, priests. We are grateful for your personal kenosis for Christ and his people. Grateful that you gave up the possibility of having a wife and a family, a successful career and a private existence. We thank you for your generosity in serving God's people. We thank you for that smile that conceals the pains and disappointments inherent in a life of ministry. We thank you for your patience with your bishop going on 21 years. God bless you. Your kindness to the people and your care for your brother priests. We thank you for having the determination of an athlete to spend yourself for the coming of the kingdom. Last year at the Chrism Mass, we reflected on the importance of gratitude and empathy in the life of a priest, two virtues that are transformative and truly enhance our interior life and the effectiveness of our ministry. Today I would like to reflect, reflect briefly on the priorities of the first priests and bishops that are presented in the Acts of the Apostles when they're explaining the rationale for the diaconate. In part, their decision was fueled by their desire for more time for prayer and for the ministry of the Word. 2,000 years later, we still need to cultivate those same priorities, prayer and the ministry of the Word. Many other demands crowd in on these two crucial aspects of our priestly life. Without prayer, ministry can become hollow, theater, going through the motions, punching the clock, waiting for Godot. Prayer keeps us connected to the heart of the Good Shepherd. We were anointed in our ordination with the oil of gladness, and we are sent to continue Christ's mission, to bring glad tidings to the lowly, to heal the brokenhearted. We are charged to comfort all who mourn. We are all so encouraged by the accounts of our brother priests who are heroic and generous in accompanying their people in the most tragic of circumstances in suffering that often befall them. As Isaiah reminds us in the first reading, we are to place on those who mourn a diadem instead of ashes, the oil of gladness in the place of mourning. The oil of gladness was rubbed into our hands the day of our ordination. 
so that we could spread the fragrance and the joy to all. It was not a gift to be hoarded or wasted, but shared, given away. But without prayer, the chrism dries up. Recommitment to the interior life helps it to flow again. The Acts of the Apostles describes the birth of the church at Pentecost where the energy, the outpouring of the Spirit, the growth of the church, the courageous witness of the Apostles, the leveling of all barriers comes only after intense prayer to experience Pentecost we must relive the prayer of the Seneca. Praying in our secret chamber, praying together with our fellow disciples, praying in the mountaintop, in the desert, in the temple. Prayer can be filled with light as on Mount Tabor. Prayer can be an experience of darkness like Gethsemane sweating blood and shedding tears. Prayer can be dryness and silence in the wilderness. Sometimes our prayer is stimulated by consolations and a sense of God's abiding presence. But sometimes we're purified by deafening silence and the seeming absence of God. Prayer is not about consolation. To worship the consolation is idolatry. Prayer means finding God. Not present in the fire or the lightning, but more often in the whisper and in the silence. In prayer, we find the joy of a simple lifestyle free from the dictates of a consumer society. With prayer, obedience can become a joyful following of Jesus, the freest man to ever walk the earth and who is obedient unto death. Prayer is the medicine that helps us to overcome concupiscence, to live a pure life without ambiguity, compromises, or subterfuges. With prayer, the renunciation of wife and family is not just an exercise in asceticism, but becomes an expression of prophetic self-giving that avoids seeking creature comforts as compensations for what was once given with such generosity at our ordination. Personal prayer. The quality of personal prayer is obviously conditioned by how we live our lives outside of our times of prayer. We cannot unite ourselves to God in times of prayer if we are not seeking to be united with Him in all of our activities, by seeking to please Him, to do His will, entrusting our choices and decisions to Him, letting ourselves be guided by the light of the gospel and choosing among options, and acting out of disinterested love. Lack of love for neighbor, closing our hearts to their needs, voluntarily nurturing resentment or bitterness towards someone, refusal to forgive, these things can render prayer sterile, and we need to be aware of this. By contrast, acts of mercy and kindness toward our neighbor redound to the benefit of our relationship with God, especially in prayer. We must never lose sight of the mysterious presence of God in the poor, in the sick, and the suffering. If our prayer is genuine, it will bear fruit. It will make us humbler, gentler, more patient, more trusting. All genuine prayer will lead us to love God and love our neighbor more. I never used props for preaching, but if I did, today I would have brought my boomerang. 
which I have on my bookshelves, a memento from World Youth Day in Australia. It's a great metaphor for preaching. As we announce the truths of the gospel in our teaching and preaching, the Spirit brings those truths right back to confront us so that we be the first to be converted by our own preaching, lest, after preaching to others, I myself be disqualified, as St. Paul warns. As the Acts of the Apostles define the priority of our first leaders to devote themselves to prayer and the ministry of the Word, at the time of the Protestant Reformation, Western Christianity was torn asunder. The Protestants attached themselves to scriptures and the Catholics to the sacraments. The liturgical reforms of the Second Vatican Council call us to connect word and sacrament. The development of the three cycles of the lectionary, the innovation of reading from the Old Testament at Mass, the incorporation of scripture readings into the celebration of the sacraments. A few years ago, Reader's Digest brought out an abridged version of the Bible. It was reviewed in the book section of the Washington Post. The reviewers quipped, in the beginning was the Word, but the Word was too long, so Reader's Digest abridged it. We are not here to abridge the Word of God, but to devour it, to digest it, and to proclaim it from our hearts. As priests, we must be men of the book. Scriptures can nurture our faith, our capacity to pray. God's Word can be a lamp for our path. In the breviary, the church invites us to pray with the Word of God. Chiara Lobiak, the founders of the Focolare movement initiated that beautiful practice of the word of life, la parola di vita, where you take one word of the scriptures and try and live it intensely for a month and each night to review how you are doing in the light of God's word. Jesus astonishes the people because he speaks with authority. The word of God is the power to cast out evil spirits, to forgive sins, to heal and restore life. As priests, when we are faithful to meditating on the Word of God, we find that mysterious strength that nothing else can provide. The Word of God can shed light on our own lives. Scripture is a mirror that allows us to know ourselves as we are. The Bible can work on us. At times, the Word of God will correct us. At times, the Word of God will console us. The Word of God can help us to look at ourselves through God's eyes, to see the good and the evil. The Word can denounce our compromises with evil, our ambiguities, our attitudes that do not conform to the gospel message. The Scriptures can also bring out the best in us, free us from our prejudices, encourage us in moments of darkness, help us to feel the joy of God's forgiveness and love. We must unleash the power of the Word in our lives. And reading Scriptures must never be just an academic exercise or sermon preparation but a search for the living God. As someone once said, it's not we who work on the Bible. It's the Bible that works on us. The Word of God is what allows us to teach with authority, to give prophetic witness, to communicate the love of the divine shepherd. Each time... I visit St. Peter's Basilica in Rome, I always discover something new. On my last trip, I was amazed by a beautiful mosaic altarpiece right in front 
of the sacristy. It depicts the story in the Acts of the Apostles of the couple, Ananias and Sapphira. The wife is lying dead at Peter's feet, and two men are carrying off the body of her husband, Ananias. The couple had promised to turn over the proceeds from the sale of their land and were punished for lying to St. Peter. It was explained to me that that picture is purposefully placed in front of us priests as we leave the sacristy to celebrate Mass, a permanent reminder to each of us that we are called to give ourselves entirely and to fulfill our promises to God. Spiritual writers so often talk about the second call, that grace to renew our vocation, to hit the reset button, to begin again. This simple renewal of our priestly promises can be such a grace as once again we make a gift of ourselves to God and to our people. I now invite all of you, my brother priests, to join me in the renewal of our promises of ordination. We make this renewal together. Let us strive together to support one another in the ministry that has been entrusted to us. And today, in a special way, may we commit ourselves again to our life of prayer and the ministry of the Word. I invite my brother priest to please stand. Beloved sons, on the anniversary of that day, when Christ our Lord conferred his priesthood on his apostles and on us, are you resolved to renew in the presence of your bishop and God's holy people the promises you once made? Are you resolved to be more united with the Lord Jesus and more closely conformed to him, denying yourselves and confirming those promises about sacred duties toward Christ's church, which prompted by love of him, you willingly and joyfully pledged on the day of your priestly ordination? Amen. Are you resolved to be faithful stewards of the mysteries of God in the Holy Eucharist and the other liturgical rites, and to discharge faithfully the sacred office of teaching, following Christ the Head and Shepherd, not seeking any gain, but moved only by zeal for souls. As for you, dearest sons and daughters, pray for your priests that the Lord may pour out his gifts abundantly upon them and keep them faithful as ministers of Christ the High Priest so that they may lead you to him who is the source of salvation. Pray for the priests who have died since last we celebrated the Chrism Mass. Lima Gomez, Father James McCarthy, Father Edward McDonough, Father James Noon, Father Thomas Oates, Father Mario Origo, 
Monsignor Paul Ryan, Father Albert Salis, And for all our deceased brothers and sisters, that theirs might be the unending joy of life in God's presence. Christ, hear us, Christ, graciously. And pray also for me, that I may be faithful to the apostolic office entrusted to me in my lowliness, and that in your midst I may be made day by day a living and more perfect image of Christ the priest, the good shepherd, the teacher, and the servant of all. May the Lord keep us all in his charity and lead all of us shepherds and flock to eternal life. Amen. the oil of the sacred chrism. Let the unction of the chrism make both men and women pure. Hear the Lord glory. Praise them to the sick.
O God, Father of all consolation, who will to heal the infirmities of the weak through your Son, listen favorably to the prayer of faith. Send forth from the heavens, we pray, your Holy Spirit, the paraclete, upon this oil in all its richness, which you have generously brought forth from the verdant tree to restore the body, so that by this holy oils, everyone anointed with this oil as a safeguard for body, soul, and spirit may be freed from all pain, all infirmity, and all sickness. May your holy oil, O Lord, be blessed by you for our sake. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you forever and ever. strength and protection of your people, who have made the oil you created a sign of strength. Graciously bless this oil and grant courage to the catechumens who will be anointed with it, so that receiving divine wisdom and power, they may understand more deeply the gospel of your Son, that they may undertake with generous heart the labors of the Christian life and made worthy of adoption as your sons and daughters, they may rejoice to be born anew and live in your church. Through Christ our Lord. Let us pray, dear brothers and sisters, to God, the Almighty Father, that he bless and sanctify this oil so that all who are outwardly anointed with it may be inwardly transformed and come to share in eternal salvation. O oh God, author of all growth and spiritual progress, receive in your goodness the grateful homage that the Church joyfully offers to you through our voice. For in the beginning, you commanded the earth to bring forth fruit-bearing trees, among which olive trees would arise as providers of this most rich oil, so that their fruit might serve for sacred chrism. In the spirit of prophecy, David foresaw the sacraments of your grace and sang of the oil that would gladden our faces. After the world's offenses were washed away by the flood, a dove announced the restoration of peace on earth with the olive branch, foreshadowing the gift to come. In the last days, all this has been clearly revealed. When every offense is removed through the waters of baptism, the anointing of this oil causes our faces to be joyful and serene. You also commanded your servant Moses to make his brother Aaron a priest by pouring this oil upon him after he'd been washed in water. Still greater dignity was added to this when your son Jesus Christ our Lord insisted that he be washed by John in the waters of the Jordan. You sent the Holy Spirit from on high in the likeness of a dove. You declared by the witness of the voice that followed that you were well pleased in him, your only begotten son. And you were seen to confirm clearly what the prophet David had foretold in song, that Christ would be anointed with the oil of gladness above his companions. Therefore, 
we beseech you, O Lord, be pleased to sanctify with your blessing this oil in its richness and to pour into it the strength of the Holy Spirit with the powerful working of your Christ. From his holy name, it has received the name of chrism, and with it you have anointed your priests, prophets, kings, and martyrs. May you confirm the chrism you have created as a sacred sign of perfect salvation and life for those made new in the spiritual waters of baptism. May those formed into a temple of your majesty by the holiness infused through this anointing and by the cleansing of the stain of their first birth be made fragrant with the innocence of a life pleasing to you. May those anointed with royal, priestly, and prophetic dignity be clothed with a garment of incorruptible gifts in keeping with the sacrament you have established. May this oil be the chrism of salvation for those born again of water and the Holy Spirit, and may it make them partakers of eternal life and shares of eternal glory. Through Christ our Lord.
brothers and sisters, that my sacrifice and yours may be acceptable to God, the Almighty Father. May the power of the sacrifice, O Lord, we pray, mercifully wipe away what is old in us and increase in us grace of salvation and newness of life through Christ our Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. Amen. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is truly right and just, our duty and our salvation, always and everywhere to give you thanks, Lord, Holy Father, Almighty and Eternal God. For by the anointing of the Holy Spirit, you made your only begotten Son, High Priest of the new and eternal covenant. And by your wondrous design, we're pleased to decree that his one priesthood should continue in the church. For Christ not only adorns with a royal priesthood the people he's made his own, but with a brother's kindness he also chooses men to become sharers in his sacred ministry through the laying on of hands. We are to renew in his name the sacrifice of human redemption, to set before your children the paschal banquet, to lead your holy people in charity, to nourish them with the word and strengthen them with the sacraments as they give up their lives for you and for the salvation of their brothers and sisters they strive to be conformed to the image of christ himself and offer you a constant witness of faith and love and so lord with all the angels and saints we too give you thanks as in exaltation we acclaim To you, therefore, most merciful Father, we make humble prayer and petition through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, that you accept and bless these gifts, these offerings, these holy and unblemished sacrifices, which we offer you firstly for your holy Catholic Church. Be pleased to grant her peace, to guard, unite, and govern her throughout the whole world, together with your servant, Francis, our Pope, with me, your unworthy servant, my assistant bishops, and all those who, holding to the truth, hand on the Catholic and apostolic faith. Remember, Lord, your servants, and all gathered here, whose faith and devotion are known to you. For them we offer you this sacrifice of praise, or they offer it for themselves, and all who are dear to them, for the redemption of their souls in hope of health and well-being, 
and paying their homage to you, the eternal God, living and true. In communion with those whose memory we venerate, especially the glorious ever-Virgin Mary, mother of our God and Lord Jesus Christ, and blessed Joseph, her spouse, your blessed apostles and martyrs, Peter and Paul, Andrew, James, John, Thomas, James, Philip, Bartholomew, Matthew, Simon, and Jude, Linus, Cletus, Clement, Sixtus, Cornelius, Cyprian, Lawrence, Chrysogonus, John, and Paul, Cosmas, and Damian, and all your saints. We ask that through their merits and prayers, in all things we may be defended by your protecting help. Therefore, Lord, we pray, graciously accept this oblation of our service and that of your whole family. Order our days in your peace and command that we be delivered from eternal damnation and counted among the flock of those you have chosen. Be pleased, O Lord, we pray, to bless, acknowledge, and approve this offering in every respect. Make it spiritual and acceptable so that it may become for us the body and blood of your most beloved Son, our Lord Jesus Christ. On the day before he was to suffer, he took bread in his holy and venerable hands, and with his eyes raised to heaven, to you, O God, his almighty Father, giving you thanks, he said the blessing, broke the bread, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and eat of it, for this is my body, which will be given up for you. In a similar way, when supper was ended, he took this precious chalice in his holy and venerable hands. And once more giving you thanks, he said the blessing and gave the chalice to his disciples, saying, Take this, all of you, and drink from it. For this is the chalice of my blood, the blood of the new and eternal covenant, which will be poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this in memory of me. The Mystery of Faith. Therefore, O Lord, as we celebrate the memorial of the blessed Passion, the resurrection from the dead and glorious ascension into heaven of Christ your Son, our Lord, we, your servants and your holy people, offer to your glorious majesty from the gifts that you have given us, this pure victim, this holy victim, this spotless victim, the holy bread of eternal life and the chalice of everlasting salvation. Be pleased to look upon these offerings with a serene and kindly countenance and to accept them as once you were pleased to accept the gifts of your servant Abel the just, the sacrifice of Abraham our father in faith, and the offering of your high priest Melchizedek, a holy sacrifice, a spotless victim. In humble prayer, we ask you, almighty God, Command that these gifts be borne by the hands of your holy angel to your altar on high in the sight of your divine majesty, so that all of us who through this participation at the altar receive the most holy body and blood of your Son 
may be filled with every grace and heavenly blessing. Remember also, Lord, your servants who have gone before us with the sign of faith and rest in the sleep of peace. Grant them, O Lord, we pray, and all who sleep in Christ, a place of refreshment, light, and peace. To us also, your servants, who though sinners, hope in your abundant mercies, graciously grant some share in fellowship with your holy apostles and martyrs, with John the Baptist, Stephen, Matthias, Barnabas, Ignatius, Alexander, Marcellinus, Peter, Felicity, Perpetua, Agatha, Lucy, Agnes, Cecilia, Anastasia, and all your saints. Admit us, we beseech you, into their company, not weighing our merits, but granting us your pardon through Christ our Lord. Through whom you continue to make all these good things, O Lord. You sanctify them, fill them with life, bless them, and bestow them upon us. Through him and with him and in him, O God Almighty Father, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honor is yours forever and ever. At the Savior's command, and formed by divine teaching, we dare to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Deliver us, Lord, we pray, from every evil. Graciously grant peace in our days, that by the help of your mercy we may be always free from sin and safe from all distress as we await the blessed hope and the coming of our Savior, Jesus Christ. Lord Jesus Christ, who said to your apostles, Peace I leave you, my peace I give you. Look not on our sins, but on the faith of your church, and graciously grant her peace and unity in accordance with your will, who live and reign forever and ever. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Let us talk to each other. The sign of peace.
Behold the Lamb of God. Behold him who takes away the sins of the world. Blessed are those called to the supper of the Lamb. Lord, I am not worthy that you should enter under my roof, but only say the word, and my soul shall be healed. Corpus et Sanguis Christi, custodia unto me.
Let us pray. We beseech you, Almighty God, that those you renew by your sacraments may merit to become the pleasing fragrance of Christ, who lives and reigns forever and ever. Amen. Before the last blessing, I would just like to say a word of thanks to a number of people. First of all, uh, Monsignor O'Leary and his wonderful staff who work so hard here at the cathedral and always make this a beautiful and welcoming spot and he always wants to make very sure that it's very clean when the priest comes. So <laughs> he works very hard at that and we're grateful to have the Order of Malta here present, we're grateful to the sister disciples and Mother Olga and her sisters and Judy Hagloff for all the preparations and the distribution of the oils. Also to Patrick Krisak, our seminarians, Richard Clark, and the musicians, and everyone at Catholic Television. And to all of our priests, we wish you a very special congratulations on this day of the priesthood. Be assured of my prayers as I ask also for yours. The Lord be with you. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Our help is in the name of the Lord. <clears throat> May Almighty God bless you, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Go in peace. Thanks be to God. Thank you for joining us for today's celebration of the Chrism Mass from the Cathedral of the Holy Cross in Boston. It is an honor for us to present these important moments in the life of this local church to you. And please know of our continued prayers and support during these challenging days for you and your family. May God bless you. And on behalf of our talented crew here at the Cathedral and back in our Watertown studios, we appreciate your support of this vital ministry. I'm Bishop Reed. Stay with us here on Catholic TV. And when online, subscribe to our YouTube channel and visit us at catholictv.com.